do that in the past. All right. <laughs> Okay, guys, welcome. Um, my name is Sean Redmiles. I'm the director of the Fauquier History Museum at the Old Jail. Um, we have been doing these virtual lectures since June, I want to say. Um, and, you know, I just I started this job back in March, right when the pandemic hit, and we kind of had to cast about with different ways to, uh, to get our uh, history out to people. And you know, it was tough, but then when I came up with this and when I saw other people were doing this, it, we were just talking about this, it really has turned into a silver lining. Um, and one of the enormous silver linings is that we can get guests like Dr. Kelly Dietz to come here um, and give a lecture on her amazing book. Um, so just to quickly mention the reason why I reached out to her, I have used her book before for tours. Um, I wrote a women's history tour at a tavern that featured this book very heavily. It has been talked about. Yay. Yeah, it's amazing. Every time I talk to somebody about the subject matter, her book comes up in some form or fashion. So I was uh, just asking <laughs> that she uh, responded to the email and wanted to do this. So um, if you haven't read the book, you're going to learn a lot about it here, but it's fantastic. And I can't recommend it enough if you get a chance to purchase it after this. Um, I'm going to pull up her bio, guys. She currently now works at Stratford Hall. She's the Director of Programming, Education, and Visitor Engagement at Stratford Hall. She holds a BA in Africana Studies in History from the College of William and Mary and an MA and PhD in African Diaspora Studies from the University of California at Berkeley. She has taught at UC Berkeley, Randolph College, Roanoke College, University of Lynchburg, and the University of Virginia. She's a historian and archaeologist, and she is the author of the critically acclaimed book, Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine which is the subject of this lecture. It was named one of the top 10 books on food of uh, 2017 by the Smithsonian Magazine. Um, so without further ado, guys, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Dietz. We'll do questions at the end. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Dietz. Awesome, thank you for having me. Can everybody hear me? Okay, awesome. All right, I'm gonna share my slides. Um, it's great to be here. Again, thank you for having me. And just so everybody knows too, I would have driven my butt up to your museum and given the talk in person because I get any excuse to travel and to meet people that want to talk about food yeah. and history and to see an old jail, I'd be there in two seconds. So maybe next year sometime, my next project can be featured. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to share my screen and get this talk going. So give me a moment. All right. Okay, well, everyone, thank you so much um, for coming to tonight's talk. I am always honored and excited to talk about one of my passions, which is the history of enslaved cooks in Virginia in particular, which I think can easily then be sort of broadened out to look at the experiences across the United States and other colonies. Um, so the, the purpose of this book, book is multifolded, right? So but out of the fires, the title, um, the subtitle was kind of funny to me. It was not my idea. The publishers, brought it up. I had different names for it. Um, and just before I get started, are you going to do the admitting? Because I see that. Okay, sorry. I'm used to moderating these two things too. So I was like, I have to admit somebody. They're missing the talk. Okay, back to the topic. So the subtitle um, I thought was kind of weird. So let me switch this so you guys can see it. But how Virginia's enslaved cooks helped invent American cuisine. Um, when I set out to do this project, I was in graduate school and I had already spent about 10 years working in restaurants. My family's in the restaurant industry. My father was an archeologist and a historian who specialized in the colonial world, um, particularly Virginia and also in enslavement. And so I found sort of worlds gliding when I was looking for a topic for my dissertation. And I found myself sort of poking through the 18th century gazette, because that's what good nerds do. And I ran across the sale ads for enslaved folks. And I was like, okay, they're indexed. And so I got all excited because, you know, anytime you have a good index, you can get really pulled into a certain topic. And I was looking through and it said slaves as, you know, uh, butchers, slaves as carpenters, slaves as cooks. And these runaway ads um, for enslaved cooks instantly ignited about a dozen questions that I had that I thought were pretty heavy hitting. And then all I could think of off the top of my head was, 
the lack of information that we actually know about these men and women who worked in these kitchens. And so I thought to myself, okay, I have all this experience in restaurants. So I have a very particular sort of knowledge of what it takes to put on a huge meal. And then I also have all this training in African-American history. Why don't I make this my, my big and, you know, inaugural work. And it was, it ended up being my book. And so when I wrote the book um, for me, it was all about their lives and, you know, uh, dignity and all the struggles and the pride and all the things that they went through and it had very little to do with food and I realized after reading it from front cover to back which you don't do if you've written a book I know that sounds weird but when you write any kind of large project you know you're writing little bits here and there and you sew it together and you just don't ever want to open it up again and so when I actually read it I realized that it does actually have a lot to do with the invention of American cuisine and it's something that um, I didn't intend to have be the title but it also got me anchored into things like the top 10 food list you know for the Smithsonian and other venues that would necessarily go chasing after a historian of slavery. So anyways, um, this is my book and it is multifold. So a lot of the, the reasons I wrote this book, one is because of the myths, the myths that I think if any of you work in plantation museums or have visited a plantation museum or a house museum that um, has the period of enslavement attached to it, you're going to hear a lot of funny myths. And we're going to go over those in a moment. Um, but also, you know, sort of this idea of Aunt Jemima. And that's something that I think in this last year with her being retired from that company, it's um, I got a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of requests for comments when that happened because really if you think about it before this work came out and there's been a lot of work since people really didn't know a lot about enslaved cooks and even when I was doing one of my fellowships at Colonial Williamsburg and I was a grad student I was like I'm gonna do this and all these you know older scholars were like we already know about these cooks there's no reason to to explore it and it was funny because all of their so-called knowledge after I cued a little bit um, was really baked in this idea of Aunt Jemima and this loyal enslaved person you know these these men and women who were illiterate and who were somehow disconnected from the folks in the quarter and, you know, more culturally white than the ones living in the field and, you know, just sort of the loyal, happy slave that we just retired off of the Aunt Jemima box. Um, also, I really wanted to get into uh, the reality of, of what it was like to be enslaved in a domestic space. So there's a lot of differences, of course, between plantation and plantation from era from, you know, et cetera, but really what, what was the distinguishing factors and sort of the characteristics of working inside of that space, working on um, the hearth that was massive, uh, what kind of labor was involved and to really sort of uh, tether the, the romance of food to the reality of slavery. And so really sort of uh, jumping into that. And a lot of folks attend my talk and maybe some of you here are also, you know, tonight here to hear about things like puddings and pies. And I will touch on some food, but I think it's important to understand that food comes from, from culture and food comes from people cooking it. So to take it, you know, a crop and turn it into dinner um, is a lot of labor and a lot of love and a lot of energy and thought. And then lastly, the legacy of these enslaved cooks. What have they, or yeah, what have they given to American culture today um, and world culture generally? So let's just jump right in into some of the myths, which is kind of the, was some of the more sort of, I wouldn't say challenging because it was pretty easy to sort of push back against these myths, but these myths are incredibly hard and they're very, very prevalent in so many of the places that we visit, historic sites that we visit to sort of understand these people's lives. So this print right here, this painting rather, is from um, Berkeley Plantation. And it is the epitome of one of the sort of more dominant myths of enslaved cooks. The mistress there is, you know, in her beautiful pink ruffly dress, right? And they've got some very clean um, things happening in that kitchen. You know, it looks like it's been mopped a hundred times. Don't worry about the bad dates on the stuff on the walls or anything, but you see this very sterile kitchen um, where everyone's just sort of happy, you know, and look, the mistress of the house is actually cooking the food. And so when you go onto most of these tours, you hear about, you know, uh, Mrs. Lee's biscuits or, you know, Mrs. Carter so-and-so. And I really wanted to let people really sit back for a moment and think about not just the, the important role, yes, of the mistress of 
of the house as being one that was managing a lot of the meals, but was she actually in there burning herself every day on that fire? Was she in there tasting the food and laboring over that fire in a way that these other folks that are pictured here um, were forced to do? So this is one of the bigger myths. Um, of course, of course, we've got all this. Let's unpack these messy things for a moment here. Um, I, I have to say, every time I give this talk, I get an email or, you know, more recently an email, but before it'd be somebody would walk up to me afterwards, you know, I'd be signing the book or whatever. And they'd say, oh, Kelly, I, I have this, this collection of these things and I don't want them in my house and I don't know what to do with them. And so I literally have probably a hundred or more of these, you know, Black Americana artifacts because they were incredibly popular for about a hundred years. So this is called a Black Americana. It was a very effective, I would say, propaganda campaign that was born out of um, really the early 19th century when minstrel shows are really sort of taking hold and when conversations about abolitionism and um, the ethics of slavery and whether or not, you know, um, it was moral or not, were really sort of making its, their way into everyday conversation for elite um, Americans. And you have a pushback to this idea that, um, you know, slavery should be abolished and it was cruel, et cetera, by the South saying, oh, but they're like family. It's aunt so-and-so, or they're so happy working for us that we're going to start creating this propaganda campaign that's going to promote the idea of happy servants, loyal servants, um, these women in particular, who literally are, are built um, in, in the eyes of this propaganda to promote the idea of happy servants in your kitchen. So of course, emancipation comes, a lot of folks leave, and then a lot of people, even that, you know, come to my talks now that grew up in wealthy households, had an African American person cooking for them at night and had that sort of aunt figure in their house. But these particular objects uh, manifested a certain idea that really sort of took hold across the country and became, again, like I said, one of the largest propaganda campaigns um, related to the legacy and history of enslaved cooks. Another one of the myths that I, I bang my head against the wall when I go to plantations and go on tours is this idea that the kitchens were all moved outside because of fire, right? Who here has heard that? I'm sure everyone has heard that. And some of you might be guilty of telling the story even last weekend, right? So I want you to think about this for a minute. Um, the, the, uh, the meat behind this sort of idea, right, that really fed the mainstream narrative of these kitchens being moved outside um, came from this, this quote from 1705. And it says, all their drudgeries of cookery, washing, berries, et cetera, are performed, offices attached from their dwelling houses, sorry, Go back. I was trying to move this little guy right here so I can read it. Um, by which I should know this quote by heart now. Um, which by this means are kept more cool and sweet. So you know, it's hot in those kitchen. It smells in those kitchens. You got to get it out, right? And the idea of burning made a lot of sense too because fire. You know, fire is definitely a part of of kitchen life. But I want you to think about this for a minute. For instance, Stratford Hall has 16 fireplaces and eight chimneys, right? A house like that in the winter time would have had half of the fireplaces roaring 24 seven. So think about the fire hazards within the house versus the fire hazards in a gigantic hearth in a big brick space that did not have a lot of wood in it, like a house, um, where you would actually have, even in of the houses as well, um, those kitchens were typically mostly brick and they weren't built mostly uh, out of wood, even if they were inside of the house, like Bacon's Castle and places like that. So this whole idea of these kitchens somehow being a fire hazard and very smelly, I pushed back against with two things. Things. The smelly part, and this always makes me laugh and makes me laugh, and I hope it does the same to you all tonight, but I want you to think for a moment, moment about the smells that would be coming out of a kitchen, right? Yes, it was the 18th or 19th century, and in some cases it was the, you know, the late uh, 17th century when these, these kitchens were really sort of these vibrant places of production of Americana food, but I want you to think about the smells of the mutton cooking or the, the duck roasting, and then I want you to think about what people did for bathing and how infrequent they were bathing and what kind of smells you'd actually be smelling inside of the house. And so, you know, 
hygiene was very different back then. People weren't bathing as much. I mean, my goodness, I think anybody that's done any sort of research on any sort of, you know, clothing or, or hygiene habits of the 18th and 19th century knows for a fact that things did not smell like they do today. So that kind of turns that idea on its head a little bit. So you've got the fireplace thing, the fire hazard, you've got the smell thing going. And then what you have to push back against the, the fireplace thing and all of it really is that you start seeing, um, so this is it from 1705, okay? So you have an influx, influx, influx of women coming into the colony at or, you know, around the 1620s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? America or the colony of Virginia at the time was really taking hold. It was a successful place, so safe that you could actually start building places plantations like Shirley and some of the larger, bigger, more prominent plantations that you see on the James River. And then of course, later you see the ones on the Potomac, etc. So you have these large plantation houses being built. You have women starting to take over the role of this sort of domestic queen. And then you also have a decline in indentured white servitude and a sharp spike in enslaved uh, West Africans coming over. The majority of the cooks during the early period of the colony were African men. And so you see the architecture respond to these ideas of race and status. So right when the laws, the slave codes are being established and all of these very uh, sort of purposeful, intentional um, acts are happening to really designate differences between blacks and whites, you start seeing a separation of space. And you really see this in areas um, where that were predominantly, you know, um, sort of uh, run by enslaved labor. You don't see the same kind of detached kitchens um, in places all over Europe. You know, people say, oh, but they had the kitchens, you know, kitchens are on the inside and, and this place or that place. Very different history was happening here. And you see that correlation. Another thing that you see, um, and this is also part of myth and part of the sort of built environment responding um, to these enslaved cooks and to this domestic space and the influx, influx of these enslaved Africans, is you start seeing um, furniture changing and even the architectural space changing. So this right here on the left is a dumbwaiter. Now, fast forward a little bit, you've got Jefferson. Jefferson goes to you know, France, he falls in love with the food, he falls in love with dumb waiters, he's bringing all these contraptions back. And part of this, you know, of course, and part of the obsession of the Palladian design and all the sort of symmetrical things that were happening with Jefferson and, and um, others is you see this sort of obsession with classical architecture. So you've got these things like um, palace, you know, uh, palisades being built uh, between the kitchen and the main house. And you also see this influx of furniture and things like this really fancy dumb waiter. I'm sure all of you have been to Monticello and seen this where you literally can ring a bell and a bottle of wine can pop out of the fireplace. But if you think about a dumb waiter, something that most people just, you know, don't know what it, what it actually is or have ever heard of it. But if you have heard of it, you don't even think about the name, right? What is a dumb waiter? So I want you to think about for a moment the time at which these dumb waiters became very popular in the colonies. It was right uh, during the Revolutionary War period, all the way up. Again, another spike you see um, right around the end of the transatlantic slave trade. So you have conversations happening at the dinner table about liberty, right? Even think about, you know, the American revolution, right? Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. Those kinds of conversations are happening at the dinner table with an completely enslaved service staff, right? Do you want all of the enslaved butlers listening to ideas of freedom, listening, hearing about things like the revolution that happened in Haiti or later Nat Turner, these kinds of pieces of furniture actually literally were political pieces in that they were able to control who heard and who did not hear. Now, when it comes to these underground passageways, um, these are also a funny little thing. So you do, I've had pushback from people and they'll say, oh, but it was a Palladian thing. They were obsessed with that kind of architecture. It has nothing to do with power and place and race. And I like to point out that the majority of the plantations that were putting in these all weather passageways were actually digging them underground. Now that has nothing to do with architectural design or the aesthetic of your beautiful plantation home. It has everything to do with those same conversations happening that um, that those dumb waiters sort of helped 
uh, sort of negotiate conversations about freedom, having people come and visit from colonies that had already, you know, abolished slavery, right? Or people that, you know, even abolitionists coming down to the South or wherever to have these very important dinners. Those people knew that people like Jefferson and the Lees were absolutely slave owners, right? But it was a way to sort of mask the sort of uh, the busyness and sort of the uh, conspicuous consumption, if you will, of having an enslaved labor force. So you see this very interesting thing happen in those periods where the architecture and the furniture changes. Now this whistling walk underground passageway is from Berkeley Plantation. They have since taken it down. This was one of my most frustrating signs. Um, I'm also sort of obsessed with it and I want to reach out to them and see if somehow I can buy it off of them. But I want to talk about this for a moment. So this tour right here um, has a very classic narrative at a plantation museum. You, you know, you go on the tour, you hear a lot about the decorative arts, you don't hear about the women, and you definitely don't hear about the enslaved folks. Um, and this, of course, is what their old tour was. They've done some work recently. I think they're really sort of coming ahead um, with the times, thank goodness. But this, this particular sign um, really got under my skin when I was 17 years old. I grew up in California. I came out here. My dad brought me to this plantation to really sort of start steeping me in Virginia history. And even at that point, I knew there was something off. So you get the tour, you go outside and they point to the kitchen and they say underneath here was the whistling walk underground passage. And they used to make the cook or the waiter whistle while they walked through the passageway to make sure they didn't eat the food. Everybody laugh, they go on, they ignore the, the whole slave quarter part and they go down to the gardens, etc. So upon years of sort of thinking about this, doing more research, asking more questions about this whole idea of whistling, uh, there definitely was a sort of culture of, of having people whistle, but it had nothing to do with not tasting the food. So if you think about it, during the period of this plantation, which is early, this is a 17th century plantation, um, and even afterwards, the people in the big house, they absolutely knew the cook was tasting the food. I mean, how else were they getting it in there? You had, you know, um, enslaved nursemaids nursing your babies and there was a an intimacy and I'm talking not talking about a sexual one but a spatial one that people have forgotten about during these periods of enslavement this sign right here is a Jim Crow era sign these signs and this particular narrative was born during the Jim Crow era because after slavery ended a lot of people were trying to figure out how to then justify this whole separation of, of people and status because there were no more laws um, in terms of slavery to keep people separate. So this idea of this whistling walk underground passageway and not tasting the food is literally birthed out of the Jim Crow era, which is something I'm working on right now because there's a lot more that I've attached to that particular moment in time that has rewritten the history of enslavement and sort of got us to the weird place we are now where we don't know a lot about what actually happened. All right, now let's start talking about these plantations, these cooks, what is Southern hospitality? I'm sure all of you have seen pineapples all over the state of Virginia and all over the South. And I'm sure most of you know that they are, of course, representative of hospitality. Um, some people might not know why. So I'm gonna take a second to talk about hospitality, why that's relevant to enslaved cooks. Um, but hospitality in the, in, the, in the form of a pineapple came about because pineapples were one of the most rare fruits that you could get. And you would really only be getting your hands on one, say in Virginia, if you were connected to the transatlantic slave trade, the Colombian trade, if you had ships coming up, um, bringing human cargo or rum from the Caribbean, you might end up, if you're lucky, if they didn't all rot on the way up um, with a pineapple. So they were a rare exotic fruit. And so was celery. It's a different conversation, but <laughs> celery was also <laughs> considered an exotic exotic fruit or vegetable. And I don't know why that didn't make it on the tops of all the banisters all over Virginia, but it just didn't. Maybe the pineapple was more attractive or something. I don't know. But the idea is that if you had a pineapple and it was this rare, exotic, expensive, um, you know, piece of, of food and you shared it with your guests, you were the most hospitable person in the colony. So that's how that sort of became wed to that image. And of course, you don't have Southern hospitality without food. So Right now, we're going to start sort of building in the important building blocks of why enslaved cooks were not just sort of the, the you know, ultimate contributors to American cuisine, early American cuisine, but they were also very much um, 
you know, the sort of building blocks to Southern hospitality. We could not have today Southern hospitality without the labor, the forced labor of enslaved cooks. Now here is Stratford Hall where I work right now. And I want to invite any or all of you to come out and visit. Um, I've been there for almost three years. Um, I've led my team. We have completely revamped the interpretation. We've got several audio tour options and it's a phenomenal site. So please come visit. Let me know. I will give you a behind the scenes tour. It's a small enough group. I can say that I've been doing that with my big talks at Stratford. And then, you know, for four weeks after I'm like every day getting a tour. So you guys are just getting VIP treatment. So thanks Sean for that one. <laughs> Let me know if you want to come out and visit. So this is Stratford Hall. So um, this book really focused on the larger plantations. And so, you know, people might read it and say, okay, but you know, or skim it because they didn't read the part. You know, what about middling plantations? What about the, the small smaller ones where the, the white lady was actually doing all the cooking. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the homes like the, the home of the Lees, the Carters, these large, you know, four founding father homes that literally were entertaining people from all over the world. So, and, and really setting the stage of what American cuisine was going to be in a very sort of elevated sense. So this right here is the Great Hall, and I want to take you sort of through a historical trip, right? So put yourself back, let's just say it's 1750, right? This house was just built. This is the Great Hall. Um, you want to go visit the Lees because you're really, really wealthy, and you're going to go visit. Um, you all pile in a carriage. Say you live somewhere down in North Carolina. You all pile in your carriage, and, you know, days and days and days you spend on the carriage ride up to Stratford Hall, which is on the Potomac River in Westmoreland County. You might not get there. Um, of course, there was no cell phones or you can't like text your buddies, you know, hey, Lee, I'll be right there. And so, you know, you might show up at midnight, you know, if really try to, you know, everybody might be asleep, but the enslaved cook's job and everyone, including this person right here and a, a butler who would have been enslaved, would have to sit up and wait for you and your family to arrive. If you are hungry at two in the morning, if you are hungry at five in the morning, if you're hungry at noon, the enslaved cooks um, would be notified and they would have to make you some food. So these enslaved cooks had to be ready to prepare not just a little bit of food, but whatever that person wants, because if you only serve bad food or a little bit of food, it makes the big, you know, the large family look bad. So their cuisine, their, their culinary skills, their, their forced labor was very much attached to the, the hospitable nature and even that welcoming moment when they would come to a site. I'm going to take you into the kitchen itself. Um, this right here is Stratford Hall's kitchen. It looks a lot better now, but <laughs> these are older pictures. Um, this right here is Bill Payne. He was actually born um, into slavery at Stratford and worked there up into, I think, the 1920s or so. This is a picture of him. Um, we actually still have the majority of those pots that are in that photograph, which I absolutely love. That table is still there. Um, and if you see how tall that hearth is, now the Lees were way ahead of the game. So this is Miss Martha. She's been an interpreter at Stratford Hall since the 19... 70s. So she's been there for just a little while. And she's a wonderful interpreter. And she for years did um, hearth cooking uh, demos for everybody. Um, she's getting up in years now. And she she likes now to sit and watch the younger folks do it. But she's definitely still very much a part of our storytelling at Stratford. But I want to take a minute to also think about another myth that I didn't bring up earlier. But that somehow working in the house was easy, right? And you hear this a lot. Um, I'm a professor of African-American studies when I teach, I'm not teaching right now, but you get a lot of oral history passed down that really, you know, this idea that like, oh, well, you know, they were house slaves, they had it easy, or they were house slaves, they were light skinned, you know, the darker skinned ones were in the field. You have all this very strange, very racialized sort of mythology around the house versus the field. Um, through my work, I've debunked pretty much all of that. So I want you guys to think for a moment about what it would be like to have to work in this particular kitchen, which is gigantic. So you see how tall it is. Now I am 5'10". I can stand up and walk right into that thing. It is the largest hearth I've ever cooked in or worked with, and it's a phenomenal place to see working. But imagine this, cooking dinner for, say, you know, 30 people, the leads are having one of their, you know, famous dinner parties, and you're having to cook a three course meal 
with about seven to 10 things on each course for about 30 people. Imagine what you would have to do, not only the day of, but leading up to it. And so this is one of those things where I took my years in the restaurants and I used that that uh, sort of knowledge when I went into the archive. So I, I went into the archive and I must have read dozens and dozens of 18th and 19th century cookbooks that were handwritten. Yes, Mary Randolph is amazing, but I'm telling you in the, in the archives, you get ones that, I mean, there's crazy stuff in there, but even better is not just the recipes, but just like anybody would do if you got your grandma's cookbook or if you went to an estate sale and got some good old church cookbooks and you open those recipe books up and the dirty paper Ages, you know that those are the ones that you want to cook first because those are the ones that have been cooked over and over and over again. Um, so little things like that I used to sort of really figure out in addition to looking at the menus that are sometimes recorded, but really looking at these cookbooks as a primary source, um, a, a, not just a written one, but as an actual artifact to really analyze like an archaeologist or like a cook would. So one of the things that I found um, in that during that process was that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, recipes such as okra stew, and I'll talk about these more a little bit later, peanut soup, all of these African recipes started making their way into these cookbooks by the 19th century. And I'll get I'll get more on that in a moment. But I want to take you also um, just think of a 24 hour shift in one of these kitchens, you would be working at a plantation like the Lees, there would be one head chef, there might be a couple of assistant cooks, and there might be a couple of folks just prep people, you know, picking beans, etc, having to cook a massive meal. Um, also, so, you know, not forgetting the fact that these folks were enslaved. The accounts of abuse um, for people burning biscuits is very much a part of some of their stories, um, as are moments of pride where their food being praised around the world and they're being sort of elevated up. I'll talk about one of those elevations in a moment um, to celebrity chef status. So you have to think about these enslaved cooks as having very complicated and very um, intricate lives, ones that were very, very hard, both emotionally, um, status-wise, and also physically. Lifting hot pots of water on that open fire. Um, enslaved cooks died from burns more than any other uh, group of people. And one of the things that has been passed down through oral history that I've heard from several um, African Americans who told me stories about their grandma and their great grandma is that they would have to put their arm in the bake oven um, to see if the oven was ready hot enough for baking bread. Now you're cooking every single day. You have to make biscuits for the family every day. You can't have stale food for the Lees or any other family of that status. And so having to put your arm um, to where your hair is burning off every day to check the temperature of the oven cumulatively, that's going to do a lot of harm. So think about that. Um, also, just think about having to be watched, you know, 24 seven people in the field, you know, they had overseers down there, but there was a moment where they had a little bit of privacy, you had absolutely no privacy in that kitchen. Um, so that's something to think about as well right here. Um, so again, think back to visiting one of these homes. Um, I see women, except for Sean and my little rundown here. And so ladies, we would not be allowed into the space, but men, you would be absolutely granted an invite into the parlor to talk politics and, you know, big things and maybe wear your wig. And in this space right here, I want to, again, sort of really insert the labor of not just enslaved cooks, but the labor of enslavement itself. So these men right here are drinking probably Probably sherry and wine. They're smoking tobacco. Um, they're doing all of these, del you know, delightful things. The brandy, the wine, right? The the rum that's all made from enslaved labor. The tobacco that they're smoking, also enslaved labor. And this particular image right here, and I don't have the citation. It's on my other slideshow. Um, this, of course, does not have an enslaved person working in that space. But if this was in the colony, would have had this dude over here would have been an enslaved person coming in and out, um, bringing the food to these sort of elite men. So literally the, the politicians, the forefathers of our country, the elites were literally and figuratively consuming the fruits of enslaved labor. So you can't, you can't unbake that out of the, the scenario of, of sort of how essential all of these things were to the building of this country. 
Of course, the importance as well. Oh, there's somebody that would have been in the room. Robert, <laughs> your head just popped up. Sorry, I'm getting excited. Okay, here's another thing that enslaved cooks would have had to be responsible for is um, entertaining parties, right? So I, oh man, I'm telling you, I would love for so many reasons as a historian, I would love to go back and interview people. I would be in that kitchen first and foremost, but I would also sneak my butt into one of these balls and watch everybody dance and eat the food that they were eating because when Virginians, and right here, of course, you've got the Virginia Reel, which is a very well-known dance. I grew up in Berkeley, California, and we were taught the Virginia Reel during PE. So this is not just a Virginia thing, um, but this is very, you know, very sort of emblematic, right, of these sort of gatherings that were happening um, during the colonial and antebellum era. And these were not just to, you know, let off some steam and, you know, do some dances. These were used to, you know, for political reasons, but also to marry your kids off. And so when you think about, you know, when I've read all these letters from different mistresses and sort of really sort of thinking about what it meant to put on a proper dinner, you have all these, you know, elite white ladies, very anxious, right? Because they want to make sure their best dinner is being served because the so-and-sos are coming, the Carters are coming, you know, the Washingtons are coming to dinner. We have to make sure the cook is making everything to perfection because we want to make sure our daughter is married off or our son gets the best wife in the land and the biggest dowry. So these, you know, these sorts of festivities were absolutely anchored in the consumption of liquor, of course, um, and also the food and the status of the food that the enslaved cook was cooking. Let's get down to some food here. So again, I use these images. And of course, one here is from Colonial Williamsburg. I need to just go ahead and take some pictures from Stratford because my curator has done a phenomenal job making some really good fake food. So if anybody's into fake food, not to eat it, obviously, but to see it, we've got some pretty cool stuff at Stratford. So you see these sort of spreads like this. Um, people like the Lees were eating like this pretty often, you know, so wealthy that they wanted, you know, formal dinners or what it was called supper because um, you would eat dinner later. Um, so this meal would have been sort of a midday period, anywhere from say 12 to say three o'clock in the afternoon. And this was the big meal of the day. And so during the 18th century in particular, um, you really have a, a, a change from, so I talked earlier about, you know, the 17th century and this influx of women, this influx of enslaved Africans and sort of these, these colonial homes really sort of starting to create American uh, life, right? Cultural life. So with this period, you also start seeing this sort of um, moment where, you know, all these dinners are being used to say, okay, we're actually a colony now, we're successful, we're eating like our forefathers were in England or wherever they came from, and we're going to show everything off through our food. And so you start seeing these larger former di form formal dinners happening in the 18th century, which really became the sort of, you know, social currency of the period. And of course, these enslaved chefs were cooking all of this. So every one from a James Hemings, right, who was Thomas Jefferson's enslaved chef, who was literally trained in Paris, um, all the way to somebody who nobody has known anything about until recently, a man named Caesar, who was the enslaved chef at Stratford Hall. These men and women, um, and then sort of their children who were learning the trade were really responsible for making these, these feasts um, so much a part of what we're proud of now when we think back to our culinary history. One of the things that, this is a weird slide, but one of the things that's in my book that um, I really, it was very important to sort of highlight um, is thinking about the power dynamics between the mistress of the house and the enslaved cooks. So like I said earlier, you know, you had the threat of, um, you know, being abused or being beaten. Um, the rate of the enslaved cooks families being sold off were lower than some of the others because they had such high status in that household um, that they had a little bit of protection. Um, they also were able to live with their immediate family in the house. And so they had a little bit of, of a, uh, I hate using the word privilege in the context of slavery because it's actually very, it's just a very offensive in, in the way that I'm thinking of this, but um, they had a lot of abilities to live in a certain way that other folks could not because of their status of as enslaved cooks. And because those women of the house needed to make sure that the food was good. And so there was this whole power dynamic. But one of the most powerful things that enslaved cooks sort of wielded in their, in their, in their sort of power box was the ability to poison their enslavers, or at least the threat of, of, of poisoning them. So if you think about this and you know, I'm sure I give this talk a lot and sometimes people laugh afterwards and say, you know, 
some older women might say, yeah, you know, when I was, you know, at the height of my, you know, uh, housewifery back in the 1960s, I absolutely thought about poisoning my husband when he was being a jerk. So just imagine adding, right, the level of, of power and control and oppression of enslavement into that want of just making someone have a stomach ache, right? So a lot of the enslaved cooks were, um, you know, absolutely in charge of not just cooking the food, but also making the medicine for the white family. So those cookbooks that I talked about earlier, the first maybe five sixths of, of the cookbooks, um, it's pretty much all recipes. You get back to those last few pages, it is tonics, it is, you know, herbal remedies and teas for ailments. And a lot of times the, the, the midwife of the house, the nursemaid would come down to the kitchen and get some medicine for the master and bring it back up into the house. Now, several cases of, of attempted poisoning um, went to trial. Some people were accused, some, some were let off. I have a whole section in my book that literally just sort of, it pauses the, the role narrative and I start listing the names of the people who died because it's a very striking thing to see a list a very long list of people who were executed right hung um, you know all other kinds of executions for poisoning the people that were enslaving them especially if you think about the fact that there were no there was no germ theory back then and a lot of people were just getting sick because there was no refrigerator. So a lot of the attempted poisonings might not have been poisoning at all. So again, this is really sort of one of those moments where you look back into history, you're never gonna tease it out, but it was definitely part of the, the relationship between the two, the two parties. Um, also, there was moments like when that Turner's rebellion occurred, when you saw sort of a, a rash of fury, like running through these, these ladies' uh, letters because they were terrified to eat the food that their cook was cooking because look what happened in Southampton County. So you have these moments where I think that power really pops up in the record and the rest of it you have to just basically infer. One of the myths that I talked about in the beginning right now too that I want to touch on um, as we sort of start to wrap this up a little bit and I'll open it up for Q&A, um, but I want to talk a minute about that, that sort of falsehood that the enslaved cooks or people in the house were somehow more culturally white or disconnected from those in the slave quarter. And this is something that is a very common um, sort of misconception. Um, it, you know, it's baked into literature, it's baked into sort of common consciousness. And through archaeology and the historical research that I did, um, I found a bit of a bit, a lot of evidence that these these places actually um, these places, the kitchens themselves and the cooks themselves were actually a lot more connected to the entire enslaved community than common knowledge gives them credit for. Um, and moreover, they were also practicing um, traditional West African religion. And so in places like Virginia and in Maryland, you see evidence of hoodoo being practiced in these kitchens. And so this right here is a Congo cosmogram. It's all about this sort of crossroads. If anybody knows anything about Robert Johnson or any kind of you know, uh, West African, African-American spirituality, you know a lot about sort of the notion of the crossroads and crossing over. And so you see these, um, these kitchens here. This right here is the Flower 200 kitchen from, <clears throat> excuse me, the Wilcox era of Flower 200, which is in Prince George County, um, across the river from Jamestown and down a little bit. And these, along with other kitchens throughout Maryland and Virginia, um, archaeologists started finding what's called a little cache. So it's like a little bag, like a juju bag or um, an assortment of things like shells and pieces of metal, um, you know, uh, objects that they would use to conjure the ancestors or put spells on people. So you have this very active uh, spiritual place, a powerful place, if you will, in these kitchens where the enslaved folks, you know, there's all these records where white folks are like, oh yeah, the kitchen, you know, everybody was in and out of there again. So you have cook to work 24 um, seven. And a lot of times the folks from the field would come up just to keep that person company or come get a little spell to put on somebody or conjure the ancestors. And so there was so much more cultural interaction between um, the generations of people that were coming in through also uh, the white folks coming into the kitchen and the uh, folks that were in the, the quarters coming up into the kitchen and this sort of cultural and culinary crossroads that were happening, um, I think is something that cannot go unnoted. So dishes um, right here, this is our, our 
current a table at Stratford Hall. This was from one of our cooking uh, demonstrations that we did with Dontavious Williams. Um, but dishes like okra stew, um, peanut stew, black eyed pea, collards, a lot of these things um, came right over. The recipes came right over from West Africa. So okra came over from West Africa, black eyed peas, um, peanuts as well. And you, I can't think of a more Virginian soup than peanut soup, which you can get at, at least back, you know, when I was sort of coming up in the the 90s and 2000s, you could go to places pretty much all over the state. And a lot of those places sadly are gone now and get a really beautiful peanut soup. And that is a verbatim West African recipe. So you start seeing things like gumbo and okra and tomato stew and hop and john and peanut soup and jambalaya, which is a direct descendant of jollof rice. All of these West African dishes have become so much a part of what we think of as Southern food, which I would argue because it's such distinct cuisine and our, our nation started in the South, um, I would argue is the original American cuisine. And so then gave birth to the rest of the regions. I mean, I grew up in California and I can think, I guess my, you know, our culinary food out there is a little bit of everything, you know, when you think about New York, it's like there's regions that have a dish, you know, Philly cheesesteaks, the New York bagels. I and mean, we can sort of think of these things when you really think about if you had a plate of a distinct sort of a very distinct sort of American plate, so much of what would be on that plate is actually Southern. And so that Southern food, of course, came from these enslaved cooks. So much of it was a mix of West African recipes and ingredients all the way with the Native American crops that were here and also with the European um, recipes all coming into one. And I think that, you know, by talking about food, it's such a wonderful and important and I think impactful way to really get into the sort of harder conversations about race and the history of racism and slavery in this country um, because the average person wouldn't attend a talk, right, on just, oh, we're just going to talk about slavery tonight. Most folks run the other way. When you bring food into it, it not only couches, I think, you know, some very important parts of that history into the conversation, but it also brings in folks that not wouldn't normally want to have the conversation. Um, so before I wrap it up tonight, I want to introduce you all to two of my favorite people in my book, and I'm not kidding. So the first person here is on the left. Um, she is the cover of my book right here, Bound to the Fire. She is right there. And she, um, she lived in Amherst County, Virginia, which is between Charlottesville and Lynchburg. And in 1855, <clears throat> um, Hunter Strother was traveling around. He wrote for the Harper's Weekly and he was making a trip to the South um, to record what he saw, you know, like he was a, a reporter and he liked to write stories and he was an artist. And so he found himself in the middle of the night pulling over um, to this person's house. He saw some lights. He went to go see if he could stay over and he found himself meeting this woman who he doesn't mention by name. But he talks about her um, being, you know, as basically running the show there. She was the, you know, what did she, what did he say? Uh, her children have the first uh, dip in all gravies, the breasts of fresh chicken. You know, her wisdom is far beyond, you know, compare. He was waxing poetic about this woman who he actually took the time to draw. And if you see this drawing, there's so much in here. And this is a, you know, I think a really important image. Um, one, because it shows us who, you know, this woman was. We don't know what her name was, but we see what she was cooking on. We see her clothes and her shoes. And we have all this really important sort of material culture sort of, you know, uh, texture to this image. But I think it's also equally as important that she doesn't have a name. So we can attach so many of the stories of people that we do not have images of or stories of to this woman. And that's why I chose her for the cover of my book. She represents the countless men and women and children who worked in these kitchens, um, who also worked the fields, who were enslaved in this country and others who are not in the written record and absolutely never had their portrait drawn. So I love the fact um, that we have this image and that I can talk about her with dignity and give her the credit she deserves um, long after she was captured by him. Oh goodness, yeah, 170 years ago. Um, on the right here, we've got Hercules. Now before, I've, I should know this by heart, but I'm just gonna make sure I don't mess the dates up. He is, this is actually not Hercules, by the way. I don't wanna cry tears on this talk, but this image right here was believed to be Chef Hercules, George Washington's chef for 
I don't know, a good 15 years, right during the peak of my research. And I was like, yeah, we know what he looks like. This is him. This is great. It's not him. They figured this out about a couple of years ago, broke my heart, but at least he didn't make it on the cover of my book. That would have been embarrassing. So, all right. So Hercules, I'm going to talk about him for a second and then I'm going to open it up for questions, but I have to, to lead with him. So I like talking about Hercules because one, he's sort of the underdog when it comes to the two sort of most famous chefs of the era. Everybody I think knows about James Hemmings. They talk about him everywhere. Monticello is, you know, proud of that history as they should be. And the, there's an organization named after him. I mean, absolutely stellar story. But for me, Hercules, I consider to be the first celebrity chef in America, and I'll tell you why. So let me give you a little background on this guy, because he's a pretty, pretty phenomenal human being. Um, he was born in 1754, and he was bought by George Washington when he was 16 years old. He was brought to Mount Vernon, eventually, uh, where he met his wife, who was named Alice, and she was a seamstress. Um, and that's important in a minute when I talk to you about how he would dress. So they had three children, Richard, Evie, and Dilia. In 1786, he was 32 years old, and the whole time he was at Mount Vernon, he was working in and around the house. You know, he was one of the enslaved domestics. He was doing skilled labor. He got pulled into the kitchen at 32 to start learning how to be a chef. He trained under a man named Nate, and he did that for a couple of years. And then late in 1790, George Washington, right, the first president of the United States of America, is going to move up to Philadelphia and do his little presidential stint up there. And not the White House, but the house, the presidential home that's now gone, but in Philadelphia. And so he brings a small group of enslaved laborers with him, and he takes Hercules to come learn the um from uh, I'm blanking on his name uh Samuel I'm totally spacing out there was a tavern keeper one of you guys is probably saying it right now with your microphone muted um anyway so he goes up to to Philadelphia he's in the president's home he learns the uh the really sophisticated kind of cooking that you need to be doing if you're cooking in Philadelphia for heads of state from all over the world the president chef so he becomes so well known that he develops this incredible reputation so first of all, Philadelphia. Um, so he gets there in, in 1790, right? He becomes the chef pretty quickly. And Philadelphia had a very large free Black community during this period. And so Hercules, as the chef, was able to go to market every day to get the fish or whatever he needed to to come back. So he's meeting all of these very established free African Americans. You know, this person is enslaved and he's like, hold on, there's a whole city here filled with free Black folks. This is really, really interesting. So every day he's going Going to get his market, you know, going to get his food. George Washington also quickly finds out very quickly, actually, upon his arrival with his group of enslaved laborers, um, that in the 1780s, Pennsylvania established a Gradual Emancipation Act. And it's kind of hilarious to me that George Washington didn't know this. Um, one, he was the president, and two, he was moving to Philadelphia and didn't check the laws. But that law said that if you had enslaved individuals, in the state of Pennsylvania, after six months, they would all be set free. So George Washington gets really nervous, starts writing back and forth, trying to figure out how to get around this. He decides to not tell them about their rights, and he just is going to bring them back to Virginia and re-enslave them every five months and change. So I want you to think about people like Oni Judge, who ran away, or Hercules, who I'll tell you his ending in a moment. Um, they are forced to, one, be in the city that has this vibrant free Black community, they're networking, they're, they're meeting all kinds of heads of state from all over the world. Um, then they are being sort of shystily sent back down, right? Like he doesn't realize they know, right? Washington doesn't realize they know, but they do. They're going back and forth between Virginia back up to Philadelphia. And in those, in those trips, I guarantee that Hercules probably learned every single way to get from Mount Vernon to a free state during those trips that he took. Um, so anyway, so Hercules is so well known um, and becomes so famous for his food that he starts selling his leftovers out of the back door of the president kitchen for up to two hundred something dollars a year. So he is not only entertaining heads of state and becoming a very famous chef, but he's also selling his leftovers out of the back door 
George Washington's step-grandson has a wonderful uh, sort of recollection of, of Hercules that's in my book. And I'll just give you a quick little tidbit, a little snapshot. This is where I bring back Alice, his wife, who was a seamstress. And if I ever make a movie about this, I this is there's so much texture in this description. So Hercules, and I think of him as sort of like an African-American Gordon Ramsay. You know, he ran his kitchen with his iron knife and everything was perfect. And he would, you know, he would finish the night and then he would go get dressed in the most fine outfit you can imagine. I'm talking silk stockings. You know, um, he had this big hat. He had a gold chain and a cane that he would walk down. Um, blue, beautiful livery. He would walk down Market Street and white men would bow to him. So if this is not America's first celebrity chef, I don't know who is. Um, so I think of him as really this sort of superstar that hasn't had his time to shine yet. Um, so he has this tenure in Philadelphia. Then in... 1796, he is sent back, um, packs his stuff up. He's sent back down to Mount Vernon and he is listed as shoveling manure on the plantation. So you can imagine someone who was born into slavery, who had that life, right, um, was probably, you know, dressing in a way that his late wife would have really appreciated with all the stitches done right. I mean, this pride and dignity and fame that this man had, um, he was sent back to shovel poop at Mount Vernon. So I'm sure there's no record of how he felt, but I'm sure we could all imagine his emotions of having to do that and how shameful that must have been, especially coming back, having all of that fame back onto that plantation. And so a couple of months later, on George Washington's birthday, 1797, George Washington wakes up and Hercules is gone. Hercules escaped, and I'm sure with help from one of the many fans of his as far as his food or any of the people that he probably met when Washington was sending him back and forth to keep him enslaved. So it's kind of one of those, it's a bit of a poetic justice, I think. Um, he apparently ended up in New York City and was working up there for a long time, and his grave um, is, is in New York State. And, you know, he was free for the rest of his life. So I love his story because... One, I think the, the sort of trajectory of where he came from and what happened and how he escaped is quite fantastic. Um, but I also just feel like he just needs to have a moment to, to shine. So I'm going to end right here with this image, right, um, of the liberation of Aunt Jemima by Betty Saar, 1972 in Berkeley, California, where I grew up. And I like to leave, leave with this image because... I'm hoping now with all of what I just told you, and maybe if you've read my book, you might know more about enslaved cooks than you did before, but I like to think that, you know, their legacy is not just in the food, um, but I wanna think about, I want all of us to think about them more critically and really think about them as subversive players and their oppression, um, absolute, co you know, contributors to American cuisine and also very significant to the birth of our country. Thank you. All right. All right. Wow. Um, that was amazing, Dr. Dietz. Uh, Thank you. I, I think I mentioned that we would do questions. Are you okay with doing that for a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Awesome. Um, do you want to read them or should I read them? <laughs> <laughs> if you guys, if you have questions, we're going to do this two ways. Um, you can put them in the chat and I'll read them. Or I have the gallery of everybody's faces right now. You can um, come on video and raise your hand and I'll know that you have something and I'll, I'll, I'll come to you when it's time. Um, and I certainly have a couple questions myself if we don't get any more than that. Um, but let's start with one that I actually also had Sheridan, um, and she put it here in the chat. Um, this is from, you just talked about Hercules. She asked, how did you find out that that was not a real portrait of Hercules? I, I wondered that myself. When oh, yeah. So an article came out, I can't remember who released it. But an art historian did some research on it and realized that the, the hat and the style was totally the wrong era and it wasn't even a chef's hat. And Guys. <sighs> Just the, the I cried a million tears. I really did. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. I mean, it, it's still an amazing story. And in some ways, I think that from his description of wearing like blue and gold and all these vibrant colors, you know, if there's going to be a rendition of him, I think it needs to be a little bit more popping than that right. image anyways but is there any idea alas, or where that came from that that portrait do they have any idea about that oh god i i think it's it's from they found it in spain and so and i can't remember i can't remember the provenance or what they figured it out i pretty much was so heartbroken when i found it it wasn't him that i i never wanted to think about it again <laughs> <laughs> that's understandable that's so understandable 
Um, so let's see, Joe and Karen. Oh yeah, hey Joe, hey Joe and Karen. Um, we have a kitchen in the basement we assume was used by slaves. What can we look for to help us make a more definitive answer? It's a good question. What's the date of the house? Um, I, they can answer, but I actually know that they can date it to like the 1820s. So I think we, there's a- We have it to 1811 at the moment. Hey, Karen, there you are. Okay. <laughs> but Joe and I are actually on two different videos. I'm at work, so. Okay, got you. Okay, so, I mean, I would, I would bet, uh, do you know if the, the family were like enslaving people or? Uh, I know, yes, we do know that, yeah. Okay, then absolutely, I mean, yeah, that's, there definitely were enslaved cooks in there. Absolutely. A quick background: in actually, the, the the person who lived in their house at that time was the jailer here at this um, at this jail, Benjamin Lacken. Okay, I gotta. Now I'm mad we're on Zoom. So yeah. post COVID, I'm coming out there. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was gonna yeah. follow up with you. <laughs> Please, no. I got any excuse to see an old kitchen too. I'm all about it. I'm actually working on a book project right now with um, three African-American interpreters who do hearth cooking. And we're doing a sort of survey of, of kitchens and oral histories and it's gonna be a whole thing. So gonna have to include that in there. Yes, be we, uh, and, and one question I had that goes with Karen's question about her home is about our jail. You know, we have this kitchen that was built in 1823. We suspect that it was, uh, that enslaved cooks cooked inside of it, but we don't know hundred percent for sure. Um, so if you ever do get the opportunity to come here, I would like to kind of like figure that out. It's separate, it's separate from the building in that we believe at this point, having looked at the documents that the entrance that we have into the building maybe didn't exist. And that the only way to get in was from the okay. outside, and that there's stairways to a room up above. So we don't know anything about more than that yet, but hopefully someday we will. Um, Sheridan, you have your hand up, go ahead and, and uh, come off mute and ask a question. Thanks, Kelly, for being with us this evening. You didn't speak about it um, in your talk, but you have a large paragraph in your book about how the enslaved cooks couldn't read, mm. but that they had to have some sense of that was ginger in this jar or that was lard over here. So either they were taught Mm -hmm. or they learned by some sort of pattern. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on the other things that you found Ab there? Absolutely. Um, and actually, you know, enslaved cooks, a lot of them were literate. I mean, it wasn't something that they were going to advertise, but just, you know, pragmatically thinking about the importance of knowing how to read a recipe. You know, even if you can't sit down and read, you know, a Shakespeare book, you're going to be able to read, you know, at least to a certain level to be able to get through a recipe and make sure the food is all what it needs to be. And so absolutely, um, some of them were literate. Um, and moreover, we're finding more and more too, as more archeology span comes, you know, evidence comes out that a lot more enslaved folks were taught to read. Um, it was very secret, but you're we're finding things across, you know, the South, uh, even places in the North that had enslaved folks, um, you know, you're finding evidence of, of slate pencils and things like that and sort of reading things, the things associated with learning the alphabet and stuff like that in these sites. And so, you know, you can have a law all you want to. And as an archeologist, when I would teach my archeology span of slavery classes or any archeology span class, I would say, you know, archeology span is really important because you can walk into, you know, say you walk into a classroom and it says no eating, huge sign, right? There's your written record. You look in that garbage can and you see a bunch of McDonald's boxes, everyone's eating. So if we only go by what's written on the wall or in the archives we're missing half the story really thanks for asking um okay so uh, anybody else have any questions uh, robert's waving robert all right yeah robert come off <laughs> thank you so much for your presentation it was fantastic thank you you could talk a little bit or perhaps it's just a minor situation where uh enslaved blacks were used in work environments other than a plantation. Mm -hmm. Real quickly, I'll tell you that my interest for a year and a half has been doing research for Falkir Springs Country Club, which for mm. 80 years was a major, major mineral spring spot. Oh yeah. Retail business. So they had blacks, most yep. of whom were leased from area plantations for the, the high food. Um, it Absolutely. also included freed men and freed women. Right? And mm -hmm. then there was community of Blacks that were there full time. And what mm -hmm. I can't understand is that there were some tensions. 
there was rivalry. It was a hierarchical structure. Uh, there was a power kind of network going on. And also uh -huh. the top ones had an opportunity for advancement to move from a skilled person in the kitchen to a feed slave status. And maybe then to work for somebody else during the off season. Are there other examples? Yeah, absolutely. So I worked for a couple of years at the University of Virginia. So, you know, that entire campus, that entire campus was built by enslaved laborers. If you think about it, think about the architecture of the South. Think about all the bricks. Think about all the buildings that were built before 1865. Those were all, I guarantee, it was either some really poor white folks or it was enslaved African and African Americans. So when I show people around Stratford Hall, I talk about those first enslaved Africans that were brought over in 1738 and forced to labor there and build that actual house. You know, thinking again about, you know, how do we attribute all of the influences and you know all of the sort of legacies of enslaved labor when you think about institutions right if it's a mineral you know farm or if it's a um or you know a quarry or if it's a university or any of these sort of physical you know literal brick and mortar buildings um everything from that to thinking about what kind of structure like you mentioned like you know working up and sort of having to sort of have different ranks of different people, the more large uh, institution is, the more of those sort of layers that you're going to see. And so, you know, absolutely. But then again, you can't forget also that they were enslaved. And so they really didn't have the ultimate power of really doing anything, but there was that ability to sort of move up. And we see that in the kitchens as well. Um, there's evidence of, it, of enslaved folks working in the field that were sometimes tapped up and sort of brought up to the house to learn how to cook. Um, but mostly it was, it was kept in the family. But, you know, there were salt mines, there was I mean, any kind of labor that was done, especially if it was not appealing, was going to have enslaved labor involved. And even if it was a mixture of, you know, white folks, um, you know, and enslaved Africans or African Americans, you're going to have enslaved folks, you know, working sometimes alongside, you know, free white people, etc. I mean, again, going back to that uh, horrible Jim Crow era, you know, blue sign from from Berkeley Plantation, that period of history um, during the Jim Crow era, which unfortunately a lot of the textbooks were written that most people who are living now have read and learned about enslavement from, really had this idea of this pure separation, right? So things that you brought up, Robert, of this very sort of um, entangled sort of uh, business model, those things weren't included in all of that. That was all written out. It was like there were Black folks and they were slaves and there were white folks and they were not. And that's kind of it. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of work to sort of recalibrate our understanding of what happened. And that's a big part of it. Thank you for bringing that up, Robert. Okay. Um, so Arthreta, um, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, please correct me if I am. But she has a great comment and she has a great question. I want to read it real quick and then we'll go back to if anyone has one that they want to raise their hands for. Um, it's, oh, I got that right? Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for referring to the people as enslaved as opposed to slaves. Humanizing the people and respecting their intellect is appreciated. My great grandfather from South Carolina was a product of a cook. Depending on the period, many of those who worked in the kitchen were the product of those who owned them. Have you done any research on the native people's influence on the food ways of Virginia? Excellent, excellent question. And for those of you that, you know, if you're attending this lecture, you've probably heard people use the word enslaved. I absolutely use it. I think it's really important um, for the reasons that she said. So thank you for acknowledging that and thanking me. And absolutely. So the native parts, I and mean, it's funny because I think about this a lot when Kwanzaa comes around, which is a African-American holiday that's giving a big nod to sort of the West African roots. But one of the, the days of Kwanzaa, they use corn. And of course, corn is a Native American crop. And so, you know, you have the, the sort of Native American crops that became so tethered to African-American foodways, then being sort of thrown back and being like, hey, we're doing this whole African thing, but we're actually doing it with Native American crops. So um, absolutely. And I think that, you know, you can't think about American food and, and some of the things that we eat now, you know, cornbread and grits. I mean, these things are so integral to soul food, to African-American foodways. And these things would not be there if it wasn't for, you know, the food in the crops that native Virginians and others were cooking and growing. So great, great question. Fantastic. Um, yes, uh, so we've got Marie. Marie, if you wanna go ahead and come off mute. 
Uh, my, my question's a little similar because what about the British influence? So all these plantation owners were British, I guess. Yep, most of them. <laughs> so we, we hear about the okra and the sorghum and the, so this was kind of new to them, right? Mm -hmm. This was not their food heritage. So didn't they ask their, their chefs to mimic their food? Like, yes. did they import and so are those the puddings, I'm wondering, and things like that? The puddings and sort of the roasted meats and a lot of the pies and that spread that I showed you all um, of that very colonial dinner, you know, with all the like intricate, you know, pastries and those kinds of things. That's all a big nod to the motherland of, of England. Absolutely. Um, but what you see, which is so fascinating, is the 18th century cookbooks are all very European, right? By the 19th century, those ones that I was reading, they are writing in the okra stew, the jambalaya, the gumbo. And my theory, and I think it's pretty sound, um, just because I like to think that is my theory, but my theory is that they were absolutely eating those things. I mean, honestly, you walk by a pot of gumbo in the slave quarter, you're going to be like, okay, what are you eating? That smells amazing. It takes one smell of good food to want to taste it. So whether that enslaved cook was making that on the side when they were making that mutton pie or the pudding for the big house, it took, I'm sure, one pass through that, that kitchen to wonder what that was. And then it very quickly, really literally was written into American cuisine. I'm hungry now. I had a, I know. See, I normally do these talks with, with the African American hearth cooks that work with me at Stratford, and I'm like, oh, I want the food so bad right now. Can you smell and we have a whole series, not to plug another museum, but we have a whole series on the Stratford Hall YouTube channel. All of our food waste programs that we just did, they're all up and running, and we had a ton of phenomenal chefs. We've got one coming up on the 13th with Lenny Sorensen from uh, formerly at Monticello. So more stuff happening. I'll try to plug that uh, when we put the recording out. I'll make sure that people know to awesome. go. Awesome, thank yeah. you. I didn't know that. Um, I had a quick question that I wanted to ask. Um, so you, you, the going back to the, the whistling passage, um, so you mentioned that, yeah, that you discovered that's from the Jim Crow era, the idea that they were whistling so that they couldn't hear, so they could make sure that they weren't eating it. But you said that there is some evidence that there was a culture of whistling. Do you know what the reason for that was? If it, um, since we know that that the reason comes from Jim Crow, why was it that there was a culture of whistling in that in that situation? So, I mean, there's a lot of peculiarities that I think were born out of the nature of enslavement, and so whether it's making people dance, whether it's um, you know just a lot of the real strange sort of orders that happened. Um, but the whistling part, just like the dumb waiter and those kinds of things, just having knowledge that someone's coming so the, the conversation can change because I, I don't think you can underestimate the fear of the white folks thinking about what would happen if the majority black state of South Carolina or the majority black county of Buckingham found out that Nat Turner did what he did which they found out but also you know Haiti I mean there's just so many moments even just the ideas of freedom so I think it was a way to control conversation and and the ears that were literally by force all around them. That's what I suspected. I did. You may have said it and I just missed it, but that's what I suspected. I don't think I did. So you're good. <laughs> okay. I've given this talk so many times to you. It's like, I try to mix it up so I don't get bored myself, but yeah, cool. I hope I touched on enough stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anybody else have a question um, before we wrap up? Anyone else want to raise their hands? Anyone want to come to Stratford? Yeah, raise your hand if you want to. Okay, good. <laughs> See some hands. So right now we've got... Um, Oh my goodness, I'm curating an exhibit that's gonna be opening up in March. It's phenomenal, that's all I'm gonna say. It's all about these cultural crossroads and um, equal representation of African and, and African-American women as well as the Lee ladies. So it's, it's a very different kind of exhibit that Stratford's never had anything like that before. We've also got some pretty amazing audio tours and we're working on the African-American audio tour right now, which is gonna be about an hour plus choose your own path, take your time audio tour. Awesome. Um, to close out then, can you uh, tell the folks um, who are here now and who are going to see this later, if you wanted to go visit Stratford Hall, um, what, what are the restrictions? Can you go inside? What's going on with that right yes. now? Wanted to do that. Actually, so yeah, we opened up in June. Um, it, there's 1900 acres at Stratford and it's a gigantic house gigantic house. So the nice thing is that um, we don't have a ton of visitors, which is 
you know, it's unfortunate it's getting better, but you know, I've never been there with exception of like a Christmas tide event or something where there's a ton of people in a room and you have to run the other way. So we absolutely mandate having masks, um, social distancing as well, but you've got so much space and we've got these audio tours. You have disposable headphones. Everybody gets their own pair. They keep them like on an airplane. At least they used to have them on airplanes. Everyone gets their headphones. We clean everything. A little tiny box is big and you, you know, it's all sanitized. You carry that around and it's a choose your own adventure around the entire site. You could be there for 20 minutes. You could be there for, you know, eight hours if you want to. And it's all open. We've got an 18th century recreated garden that's stunning. We've also got a beach. We've got an 18th century mill. We've got standing uh, slave quarters. We've just got incredible, incredible history out there. So please come visit. It's an incredible space and the history there is really coming alive. There you go, guys. There's um, something that you can do right now during the pandemic that is safe and would be amazing history. Very. That's really good to hear. Um, so I'm just going to finish up with a quick plug, everybody. So um, we obviously had this virtual lecture here. We're going to try to do one of these every single month, if not more than that. Um, and next month on March 20th, we have a lecture with Dr. Ed Ayers on um, the, uh, the, his book on the Civil War. And you can see more information about it online. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Dietz. We really, we're getting so many nice comments. Um, people are saying amazing Yay. things. And, um, one says your enthusiasm and knowledge are phenomenal. Thank you. And everybody just says it was Thank really you. Cool. Thank you so much for coming and, and have a great uh, week, everybody. Thank you so much. Wait, really fast. People oh. want my email. Hold on. Yes, yes. Hold on. Email Dietz. Hold on, I'm typing it for everybody. You're gonna put it in the, uh, in the chat? You're gonna put it in the chat? Sure am. Okay. Or you can ask Bug Sean for it. He has my other email too. <laughs> he yeah. gets you in touch with me. I, but I please come out and I would love to give you a tour of the site. And you know, the kitchen is phenomenal. Oh man, I have to see Yeah, Monticello, eat your heart out. That's my big competition. I'm trying to really <laughs> out food them. It's, it's coming, watch. <laughs> Um, if you guys, I don't know when Zoom ends, if you can see uh, her email in the chat. So if you want to get it or if you, go, if you don't have time to get it down now, just definitely contact me and I'll, and I'll get that to you for sure. Um, awesome, guys. Thank you so much. And we'll, uh, we'll see you hopefully next time. And everyone have a great week. Thank you so much, Dr. Dees. Thanks, everybody. Come, come visit. <laughs> Bye.